but today we begin our discussion of my favorite writer, uh, surely the greatest writer of the 20th century who never won the Nobel Prize for Literature, Jorge Luis Borges. Borges was an Argentinian writer. He was born in 1899 and has a lot of philosophical themes throughout his poems, throughout his short stories, um, and a series of nonfiction essays. Uh, his collected works are in three big volumes, about equal size, one of poetry, one of short stories, for which he's most famous, and then one for nonfiction works. Borges got himself into a lot of trouble in Argentina for his political stances, as well as his artistic judgments, his interest in expressionism and other 20th century movements. And so he ended up having a job in the basement of the library, uh, the public library in Buenos Aires. Um, he found it a very easy job to do. He could accomplish everything he needed to do in about an hour a day. And so he spent most of the rest of his time reading and writing. <laughs> uh, in a way, it was a fantastic situation for an intellectual. He eventually got into enough trouble that he lost his job at the library. However, the government offered him the position of inspector of rabbits and chickens <laughs> in compensation. Borges, uh, rather than accept that, decided to become a visiting lecturer. By, the, by then, his work was well known. And so, in particular, he began to visit the University of Texas at Austin, where he was one of the key figures in the early days of our Latin American Studies program. And I've got a series of photographs of him here on this campus. Uh, he is known for a style of literature known as magical realism. And here we see some images of him. Here he is on this very campus, talking to students. That kind of quizzical look is something very characteristic of it. And that's what UT students look like around 1970. So... You look about the same. Yeah, well, anyway. Um, there, is a, uh, there are a series of important philosophical themes in the story we're going to discuss today. And I think one of the most central is the contrast between realism and idealism. So, let's start with that contrast. We've discussed this a little bit before, but I want to remind you of these terms because it's been a while. Realism is the view that some things are independent of the mind. They are really out there. They are independent of the way we think about them, we conceive of them, the things we believe about them, and so on. They are really, in a full sense, external to us. On the other hand, idealism believes that everything is mind-dependent. Everything is in some way constructed by, or projected by, or at least shaped by the mind. So there is nothing that can truly said to be really out there, independent of us. Everything is, in some sense, already mental, already shaped by our own cognitive and perceptual activity. So the idealist stresses our role in constructing, uh, or creating, or shaping the world. Whereas the realist says, no, 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 there are hard facts out there independent of us. They are not there because we conceive of them in a certain way, because we believe them. Um, they are there independently of anything we think or believe. <coughs> now, we can see these examples in, or these movements in art as having a significant impact. The realist, for example, in art, tends to try to depict reality as it exists. And so here, uh, trying to show workers in a field, or in this case, <laughs> a realistic portrayal uh, of a boxing match. And the realist is, in short, trying to represent the way the world is. The vision is the world is really, in some sense, out there. Um, it is independent of us. Our goal, cognitively, is to try to model it or match it or, in some way, represent it correctly. And so, in art, for example, the realist tries to do that. <coughs> the idealist, on the other hand, is often seeing the, the world as a sort of construction of the mind, and so naturally, that tends to an attitude in art of constructing things through our own mental activity. Um, the goal is not here representation, but constructing something interesting, building an interesting structure. Uh, that might be something that has some connection to the world as we perceive it, but often adding an imaginal, imaginative element here, things that you can recognize as a road and a village, but on the other hand, as having colors they would be unlikely to have in real life. There is a real idealist tradition in philosophy. It's something that in Western philosophy arises fairly late. In Indian philosophy, it's ancient. It's one of the main uh, ways of thinking about things in the entire history of Indian philosophy. It goes back 
to Advaita Vedanta within schools of Hinduism, and to Buddhism. But in the West, it really arises out of the thought of Bishop Hartley, who was the first, perhaps, to say that there is no such thing as material substance, that in fact the entire world consists of ideas. Um, it is itself mental. Everything that exists is really an idea or some combination of ideas. Immanuel Kant, although he has a section in the Critique of Pure Reason, where he, which he entitles The Refutation of Idealism, as we'll see, is basically an idealist. There are things in themselves that are independent of us according to Kant, but we can't say anything about them. We can't even officially say that they exist. Hegel then follows him in a work called The Phenomenology of Spirit, and erases those things in themselves, says the entire world is a construction of spirit, a construction of mind, but mind in a very large sense. And his book tries to trace the development of this spirit. And then Nietzsche, we've read, expressing a similar view. The world consists of a series of errors and fantasies. It is something that is itself a human construction. And all of those philosophers are thinking of the world as thoroughly meant. So there is a tradition, even in Western philosophy, of idealist thought, one that grew in power throughout the 19th century and was one of the predominant schools throughout the 20th century. Well, to most people, idealism sounds like a sort of preposterous view. Uh, Samuel Johnson is one said to have kicked a stone and said, I refute Bishop Barclay thus. Boom! <laughs> okay, I don't have a stone to kick, but I have a piece of chalk to kick. I, uh, I refute Bishop Barclay Dobbs. Barclay says there are no material objects in the world, but everything is an idea. Ah. <laughs> okay, now, yeah, I should have been a puncher. Well, anyway, uh, Barclay, yeah, it'd be great if football were played with chalk. <laughs> now, does that constitute a re refutation? Well, idealists would say, no, of course not. That whole kicking thing, that was also a, an idea, it was something that was a mental construction. Here's the kind of argument that idealists give. There are many different forms this argument takes, but I think all arguments for idealism in the end rest on a kind of skepticism, saying the only way to really have knowledge is to assume the world is a mental construction. If it's really out there, really independent of the mind, we get this problem of how our minds connect up with it. And that problem, the idealist says, cannot be solved. The only way to know the world is to have it itself be a mental construction have it, in its very essence, be something that has a link to the mind. So here's the way the argument might go. Suppose the world is, in some respects anyway, independent of the mind. It is really out there in some ways, at least. Maybe certain aspects of it aren't, but other aspects are. Um, you know, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? There's nobody there to hear it. Um, the idealist is going to say, well, maybe not. Um, maybe there are aspects of the world, maybe the entire world, is such that it's really dependent on the mind. It's dependent on being perceived. So we could ask, how could we know anything about it if it were independent? Suppose the world were truly independent of us. It was really out there. It didn't have any innate connection or intrinsic connection to the mental. Then you might think there's this unbridgeable gap between minds and the world. How could mind ever then actually relate to the world? How could we know anything about the world? So the idealist says, Look, in the end, if the world is truly external to us, the skeptic wins. It might be that we perceive things exactly as we do now, even though the world has a completely different character. It might be this way, and everything we're experiencing is really some kind of illusion. And so we would have no way of knowing whether that world out there matches the way we perceive things or not. Maybe it does. Maybe it's completely independent, has a totally different character. Maybe it doesn't even exist at all. There is no way from within our own experiences, within our own minds, we could distinguish those possibilities. So we'd have no way of knowing which way the world truly is. Basically, we would be stuck inside our own heads. The world would be out there. It could be any which way. Maybe it doesn't even exist at all. And our minds, our mental world, could be exactly the same. So we could never actually have knowledge of the world. Consider the Pacific Ocean as an example. Okay, here's a picture of the Pacific. You might have various images of the Pacific. Maybe you've been to it, you've seen it, and you're remembering. Maybe you're just seeing it in this image. This is the harbor at San Diego. And you might be thinking, okay, Pacific Ocean. Yeah, I've got this certain image. 
Maybe it's on a map. Maybe it's a view of things from a Hawaiian island or from San Diego Harbor, something like that. Well, is it the way you perceive it? What if actually all that you are aware of that you've perceived is an illusion? For example, I just told you this is San Diego Harbor and the Pacific Ocean, but what if I'm lying? That wouldn't be nice. That wouldn't be nice. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Descartes argued, we, we can trust our senses because God exists, and God is good. God would not trick us. Well, I exist, and I'm good, and I would not trick you. <laughs> so, yes, this is San Diego Harbor. But you might think, wait, what if that's fate? What if this is something put out by San Diego real estate developers? And in fact, San Diego is right next to Las Vegas, and there's no ocean there. It's all a ruse. You buy that condo, you get to San Diego. Yeah, wait, where's the ocean? Or, here's another scene of the Pacific Ocean. Well, what if that's fake? What if that's some kind of illusion? Here's another one. That looks pretty different, right? You might think these are very different views of the Pacific. Here, I'm showing you people looking out at a sunset over the Pacific. Well, you might think, wait, if the Pacific Ocean is really something out there, really independent of the mind, really such that there is no intrinsic connection between it and any idea of it, any perception of it, and so on, why should I trust that any perception of it, any photograph of it, any description of it, and so on, is actually accurate? It might be that nobody involved is trying to trick you. It might be they're all being honest. But maybe the way they've all perceived it has no intrinsic relation, not only intrinsic relation, maybe it's really misleading with respect to the actual nature of the ocean. And so you might worry that we all suffer from some kind of hallucination, some kind of illusion. We're guilty, if I can put it that way, of falling prey to illusion sometimes. Sometimes we see things and it turns out the world isn't the way we see it. What if the entire world is really nothing but a dream? What if it's nothing but a hallucination? What if, in fact, right now, you're actually asleep, back in your room, dreaming that you're in class, right? You fell asleep, but you're feeling guilty. Some part of your brain is saying, you were supposed to go to ideas of the 20th century. <coughs> And so you're dreaming that you're here in class. But in fact, you're snoozing away. Now, is that possible? How could you be sure that you're really here, that you're not asleep? In the movies, they say, oh, I'll pinch myself. But you could just as easily be dreaming that you pinch yourself, right? I mean, come on. You can pinch yourself in a dream. That's absurd. That doesn't do anything. And now, what if I say, well, it's not just that you're dreaming. What if all of us? have this sort of hallucination. The world may be, let's grant that there's a world out there for the moment. What if it has a radically different character? For example, physics tells us that this table consists mostly of empty space, that although it appears to be solid, it's not, that although it appear, appears to be stationary, in fact, the particles involved in it are vibrating and moving at a very high rate of speed. Um, it appears to have color, brown, in various shades, but actually, according to physics, the things that make it up have no color. It's not like it's made up of brown electrons. And so, actually, if physics is right, the world has a character that's really, really different from the one we perceive it to have. Now, the idealist says, look, there is no way out of these skeptical difficulties, as long as the world is truly independent of our minds. If the world is really external to us, in that radical sense proposed by the realist, then it could be any which way, and our minds have constructed this world of experience, this world of appearances, uh, as Kant would put it, in order to, well, give us some way of surviving in that world, but that doesn't mean it's anything like an accurate portrayal of what that world is really like. So we couldn't have knowledge of what the world is really like at all. The only way to have knowledge of it is to treat it as a mental construction, to assume that the world comes built in, really, as something knowable. And that's what the idealist argues. We can know about something only to the extent that it really is something we can make as an object of consciousness. It's an adaption to our consciousness. It's being structured in such a way to be conscious, uh, to be amenable to conscious awareness is the only thing that enables us to know. So the world has to be viewed really as a mental construction. Barclay takes that in its most radical form. To be is to be perceived. Some idealists like Kant treat it more as a possibility thing. It's more like to be is to be perceivable by someone at some time somewhere. But whatever we say about that, 
The idea is that it is something that has as its very existence being perceivable, being conceivable, being something we could be aware of. It has that mental potential already within it. Well, the realist, in contrast, thinks, no, some things are independent of the mind. Some things are really out there. And there we have a classic American example of realism, uh, an attempt to portray Christina's world, something that is really a depiction of the way reality is or could be. Now, let's take a look at Borges' story. Slava, Ukbar, Orbis Turkis. <laughs> because what it's doing is focusing on that question of whether idealism makes sense, what it would be like to view the world as an idealist, or whether, in the end, we have to understand the world as realist. He begins with this. He's sitting around with a friend. Boyo Casares had had dinner with me that evening. We became lengthily engaged in a vast polemic concerning the composition of a novel in the first person whose narrator would omit or disfigure the facts. We've seen that idea before, right? The unreliable narrator. And indulge in various contradictions which would permit a few readers, very few readers, to perceive an atrocious or banal reality. So he's writing this in 1940, about 14 years after Christie's novel, uh, and he's fascinated with that idea of the unreliable narrator. We're going to see in a lot of Borges' fiction that plays a role. He himself is rather unreliable in reporting quotations and reporting volumes in the library and so on. Sometimes he's reporting things that are real, sometimes not. In any case, this friend had recalled something he had heard. Copulation and mirrors are abominable. Why? Because they enlarge the number of men. <laughs> the text of the encyclopedia said, now here's a case again where we have this unreliable ability. That's what the person remembered it to say, but here's what the encyclopedia actually said once he found it. For one of those Gnostics, the visible universe was an illusion, or more precisely, a sophism. Mirrors and fatherhood are abominable because they multiply and disseminate that universe. So the idea here is really that there's a vision of the universe as something that is a construction. It is something that's an illusion, a sophism, some kind of mental construction or projection. Some kind of mistake is involved in our perceptions. Well, they go searching for an encyclopedia of Tlon, this volume that they see referred to, that is actually an encyclopedia of some other planet, some other reality. And if they find the encyclopedia collection, it doesn't have this volume. It's like, what, what is this? But finally, they track it down. The book was written in English and contained 1,001 pages. What does that make you think of, 1,001 pages? Good, 1,001 nights, right? Shahrazad spinning these stories. And so we've got a book that is doing that, spinning these stories, this elaborate series of stories. On the yellow leather back, I read these curious words which were repeated on the title page. A first encyclopedia of Tlaw, volume 11, Claire to Django. <laughs> there was no indication of date or place. On the first page, on a leaf of silk paper that covered uh, the color plates, there was a stamp of blue oval with the inscription, Orbis Tertius. Third world is what that means in Latin. And so this is like, well, some other world, some third world that is uh, an imaginative creation. Now, he begins talking about this. And what's striking about this other world, described in the encyclopedia, it is, is that it's a thoroughly idealist world. Here, our intuition is, I think, with, um, with Johnson, with thinking we can refute Bishop Barclay by kicking a stone. Common sense sort of tells us, yes, there's a real world out there, and it's independent of us. But this is a planet where people are naturally idealists. So, he says, Hume noted for all time that Barclay's arguments in favor of idealism did not admit the slightest reputation, nor did they cause the slightest conviction. This dictum is entirely correct in application of the earth, but entirely false in law. The nations of this planet are congenitally idealists. Their language and the derivations of their language, religion, letters, metaphysics, all presuppose idealism. The world for them is not a concourse of objects in space. It is a heterogeneous series of independent acts. So, what is the language of this planet like? Well, there are no nouns in it, because the nouns actually would refer to objects, and those objects are things we would inevitably think of as independent of us. So, in one region of this world, 
there are only verbs. There are only things that denote action because there are simply events taking place. There are no objects. There's nothing that could be identified as a substance independent of us. So, for example, there are no nouns in this conjectural Ursprache, that is to say, this basic language from which the present languages of the dialects are derived. There are impersonal verbs modified by monosyllabic suffixes or prefixes with an adverbial value. For example, there's no word corresponding to the English word moon, but there is a verb which we, in English would be to moon or to moonate. <laughs> the move rose above the river is hur ufang axaxas lo, or literally upward behind the onstream, it moved. Sort of cool if you start thinking. So imagine how you describe this classroom. You can't actually refer to a person or to a table or to the screen or anything else. What would you say? Talking and talking ridiculously, it. <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, even the it, like a pronoun, can we really use the it? Well, I suppose in the it moon, right? Where the it here, it's like it rains. It's just this vague reference to the entire world. Now, there's another dialect in which they're just adjectives. <laughs> okay, so instead of saying moon, they would say round, airy, light, or dark, or pale, orange of the sky, or some other such combination. But by the way, they can't say sky, right? That's an object. So they would have to say something else. But anyway, uh, yeah, this is something where it might refer to an actual object like the moon, but it might be just this imaginative construction. There would be no difference. Well. If you think about the culture of this idealist world, not only would they have no nouns, but really every science would be, in the end, psychology. Because everything is really a mental construction. So in studying geology, for example, are you really studying rocks that are out there? No, you're really studying your mental constructions. What about in studying astronomy, the stars? You're really just looking at another field of your own mental constructions. Everything, in the end, is the study of your mental constructions. So everything is really psychology. Well, that may means what about philosophy? Is everybody there just an idealist? Well, actually, since from the idealist point of view, everything is a mental construction, you can put things together any way you like. So philosophy becomes highly creative. He says every philosophy is, by definition, a dialectical game. Uh, a philosophy does as all. That is to say, a philosophy of as if. It's a famous book written by Hans Feiner in 1911, and it basically says that we construct this series of fictions and use them in understanding the world, but they're all fictions. They don't, any of them, fully make sense. They all contain contradictions. They're fictions we construct to understand the world, so we act as if the world is this way or that way, but we're not literally describing the world in any of these ways. So, it's caused philosophies to multiply. There's an abundance of incredible systems of pleasing design or sensational type. The metaphysicians of Tla do not seek the truth or even for verisimilitude, that is, getting things approximately right, but rather for the astounding. They judge that metaphysics is a branch of fantastic literature. And that, of course, is something like what Borges is doing here. Well, all of this is fine until something shocking happens on Tla. There is a heresy. A heretic arises and tells a story. The story is deeply disturbing. Here's the way it goes. On Tuesday, X crosses a deserted road and loses nine copper coins. On Thursday, Y finds in the road four coins, somewhat rusted by Wednesday's rain. On Friday, Z discovers three coins on the road. On Friday morning, X finds two coins in the corridor of his house. Now, what's happened? Yeah, the guy loses coins. He later finds two of them. Other people find the other seven, right? That's the story. Now, it's not a deep story, not a very interesting story. But nevertheless, there's the parable. Well, here's a little picture of the parable. OK, Tuesday, X loses nine coins. Thursday, Y finds four of them. Friday, X himself finds two points. Z finds three of them. Adds up to nine, right? Nine lots, nine found. Now, why would, on an idealist planet, that story be a heresy? Why is it shocking? Because those coins continue to exist while people are watching. 
Exactly, the coins continue to exist, right? Notice, what would happen if I lose my car keys? Which I used to be highly prone to do. <laughs> um, I go looking for them. And suppose later I find a car key that looks exactly like mine. I think, I found that key, right? I don't think, whoa, what a lucky thing. The world was revolved. <laughs> what, I can't even say the world. I'm not supposed to be using nouns. So I've got to say, you know, world presents dark, boxy, um, in hand, then dark, boxy, missing, then dark, boxy, again. <laughs> right? I, I, the real thing, come on, give me a break. It's the same keys. It's not like, luckily, there was this scene in which the keys went away, and then there was a scene where the keys came back. I mean, it was the same key, right? And so you might think, look, look, <laughs> there's an identity here, right? Just as here. Here's what's shocking. The nine points were there, but weren't being perceived. I've shown you what happened on Tuesday and Thursday and Friday. Notice there's a day missing, Wednesday. What happened on Wednesday? The keys existed and were rusted by the rain, even though nobody was perceiving them. But wait, if to be is to be perceived, on Wednesday, what happened? They were being, they were being rested, but they weren't being perceived. How is this possible? Okay, now, the idealists, what do they say? Well, here's what the heresy concludes. The heretic basically says, look, I deduce the reality, the continuity of the nine coins. It's the same coins. The coins existed on Tuesday when they were lost. They kept existing on Wednesday when they weren't being perceived. They were found and existing and still the same coins on Thursday and Friday. And so it's logical to think they've existed throughout all those periods in some secret way, unperceived, at every moment. But now, does this convince people? Well, no, the idealists on Tlaat are shocked. Okay? A lot of people don't even understand the story. Uh, the defenders of common sense, common sense on flaw, right? Where it's like, wait, there are no objects that exist unperceived? This is an absurd story. What do you mean? And so they say, hold on, uh, this can't be right. Surely nothing like this has ever happened. <laughs> and some of them say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're begging the question, finding and losing. You're assuming the continuity of these objects. You're sneaking it in. When in fact, look, if it's just a question of things appearing, disappearing, you know, there, there's no such thing as finding, there's no such thing as losing, that already presupposes some continuous existence. So there's something bogus about this. Others recall that all of the nouns have only a metaphorical value. Wait, you're talking about coin. Coin is a noun. You really mean something like shiny, round, <laughs> right? Um, and shiny, round in pocket becomes no shiny, round in pocket. Oh, pockets and shoot, what can I say? <laughs> uh, forget that. Um, yeah, it's really hard to do this language without pocket or hand or hand. It's like, how do you do this? But anyway, um, they denounce that this treacherous circumstance somewhat rusted by Wednesday's rain, that presupposes what the story is trying to demonstrate, the persistence of the four, four coins. Others say, look, well, equality is one thing, identity is another. You have no right to assume it's the same coins. Now, uh, in fact, they say, look, this. It'd be like, Several people suffering a severe pain one night. Would you say it was the same pain just because people suffered that pain on successive nights? No. Now, I think there is an argument underlying what the heretic is putting forward here, and it's an argument that Borges is, in effect, making. It's, let's call it the missing explanation argument. It goes like this. Reality explains our experiences. How would you explain that story? You'd say, yeah, the guy lost nine coins. And then later, he found two of them, other people found seven of them. Same coins. They existed throughout that period, right? And so there's a very simple explanation. For the idealist, it looks like there is no explanation. Ooh. Guy has nine coins. Guy does not have nine coins. Now, this person has four coins. This one has three. This one has two. Here. It'd be like, this guy has a headache. Headache goes away. Now that person has a headache. That person has a headache. We wouldn't say, ooh, where did the headache go? Say, <laughs> we wouldn't assume it's the same headache. 
So it's everybody here. Yeah, coins come and go, you know. So that's the way it is. <laughs> no, the realist says, come on, that's ridiculous. We can explain why nine were lost and nine were found. They continue to exist. Now, it's not just about the existence of objects. This is really about the regularities in our experience. So the realist says there are regularities in our experience, things like with the coins. Realism explains that. The objects really exist out there independently of us. A moment ago, I had this in my pocket. I put it back in my pocket. I reach in again. It's still there. Whoa. Now the realist says, well, yeah, you put it in your pocket. You reach in and took it out. It's no mystery. It's no shock that it's still there. But if we're idealists on the planet of Quan, it should be shocking. Right? Look, I'm having this dark, boxy experience. Now I'm not. Now I am again. <laughs> it's like that's not magic, right? But it looks like magic on Tuan. <coughs> so think about all sorts of other kinds of regularities. You look up here, what do you see? You see a screen. Now all of you are seeing it. Isn't that amazing? Last night, did any of you have dreams? <coughs> Suppose you did, and I asked you what was in those dreams, and you all had the same dream. Oh, that's With it, that'd be weird, right? That calls out for some kind of explanation. Right now, basically, according to the ideal on Tuan, you're all just dreaming this world, but you're all dreaming that you're in a classroom looking at a screen. You're all dreaming that you're listening to me. That's bizarre. What explains that? The realist says, well, you're up here talking and there really is a screen. But the idealist can't make reference to that reality outside the mind. So it's as if magically you're all dreaming the same thing. That's bizarre. Or what about this? I'm about to give you all not exactly the same experience, but a remarkably similar experience. Did you hear that? Yes. Yes, you all heard it. Oh my gosh, why? Realist says, stupid question. <laughs> because you clap your hands. That pretty sound waves and everybody heard it. But the idealist has to say, Oh my gosh, there's some weird kind of psychic phenomenon going on. Somehow, all of our minds are connected together in such a way that on command, he just says, I'm going to give you an experience. <laughs> and it happened! What kind of magic is this? Now, look, you watch me moving around. I'm on this side of the room. You're all seeing that. Now I walk over here. You're all seeing me over here. It's like in the dreams. Not only are you all dreaming, you're hearing me speak, but you're seeing me move in just the same way. How is that possible? It's like you all dreamt about, I don't know, an eagle coming down and swooping to attack you. And it moved in exactly the same way. You know, what a bizarre dream. How could we all have exactly the same dream? It looks like from an idealist point of view, there's just no explanation. Now, there's also a way of formulating this argument in terms of a best explanation. The idealist maybe can come up with some other kind of explanation, but the realist can say, look, I've got a very simple, easy explanation. He really is moving around. He really does have the key in his pocket. The nine coins really did exist, okay? He really did clap his hands. There's a very simple explanation for all of this. What kind of explanation can the idealist give? Maybe there's some story, but it's surely going to be more complicated than the real story. After all, it has to not only explain why you all have pretty much the same experience, but the minor variations. You're going to hear this at slightly different times, for example, depending on how far away, away you are. You're going to perceive me in sl at slightly different angles. Now, some idealists, like the pragmatists, say, well, the truth is just what we all agree on. So here's what it is for something to be true. It's just we all agree on it. We're all hallucinating, dreaming. Similarly, the truth is just where our dreams agree, okay? Where these mental constructions agree. But that's weird. We can say, wait a minute. Okay, suppose we'll all agree in the end on something or other, on the truth of the proposition B. Why will we agree on that? Let's say we'll all agree later that I clapped my hands during this question. Why will we agree on it? The real says, because you didn't clap your hands. Okay, that was true. That is to say, it reflected the way the world really was. There really was a hand clap. What can the idealist say? What can the pragmatist say? There won't be any explanation for why we'll all agree. There's nothing but the agreement. Yeah? Uh, is it for pragmatism? Like, would that like, deny like, uh, like anything moving on or like, progressing? Does the government like, agree that what's something is one way? Is it kind of like, maybe discovery? 
Oh, that, that's right. Actually, that's a very good point. The, I, the prime minister, to make this story plausible, has to put this eventual agreement infinitely far away, basically, in this uh, highly idealized scientific world where we all know everything we can possibly know. Uh, because otherwise, if there's the potential for learning something more, uh, an agreement there might be disrupted by some future fact. So you have to imagine that we've somehow gotten to the end of time and know all possible facts, have had all possible experiences, and so on. So, yeah, it has to be a very, very abstract, idealized picture. Now, here's a way of illustrating it with my cat, Zadok. Here is Zadok up in a tree. I got Zadok because a student showed up at the final exam and said, <laughs> uh, you have to drive me home. And I said, why? Well, I have something for you. Uh, <laughs> I should have been more suspicious than I was, rather. But anyway, I drove her back to her apartment, and there was Zadok. And so, um, I mean, it wasn't quite that mysterious. I said, well, what, wait, what do you have for me? And she said, a cat! So I said, well, let, yeah, that, yes, of course. <laughs> anyway, if you look at this now, you're all having this perception, right, of a cat in a tree. And the two little things there are meant to look like stop signs are meant to indicate your minds. And you're having this little fun. A cat, a cat. Now, imagine that there are two of you and you're both thinking, a cat. Okay? What explains you're both having that perception and you're not thought that's a cat? Well, I've got little arrows here to indicate that the cat is responsible for my photograph of it, which then is responsible for you perceiving that, right? And so there is something in the world, the cat and then the photograph of the cat, that actually leads to that agreement in your minds. But now, what is the idealist explanation? That cat now is not something that exists independently of the mind. It's something that has to be viewed as some kind of mental construction, something shaped by the mind. Well, in that case, the arrows have to go in the other direction. But that means it's mysterious. I can't explain why there's an agreement between your minds, having this perception and thinking, a cat. Instead, I've got to say, you know, I can't say, oh, that's because there's a cat <laughs> that's exerting this causal force. Now, the cat is the result of your minds doing this. So wait a minute. What is going on? How do we explain that agreement? Why is it that the both of you have that perception of a cat? Have that thought? A cat? Well, here's Bishop Barclay's answer. The cat is an idea in the mind of God. Okay, yes, it's an idea in your mind. And it's an idea in my mind and in your mind. But how do they all agree? Why are we all thinking about it? Because God is thinking about the cat. Okay, it's an idea in the mind of God. It's a perception in the mind of God. And luckily, God is sharing that perception, that idea with you. <coughs> that has some drawbacks as an explanation. <laughs> For one thing, why are people out there perceiving the cat and thinking the same thing? Well, Kant says, ah, oh, the explanation must be things in themselves. The ding an sich, the unconditioned equal to x. Tell me about the thing in itself, Kant. No, I can't. <laughs> Yeah, that's a terrible joke. <laughs> I, why can't, why can't Kant tell us uh, about it? Because it's the kind of thing that lies beyond the bounds of thought and beyond the bounds of language, so I can't actually tell you anything about it at all. I can't even say there is such a thing. Well, okay. Hegel says, well, thought is historically conditioned. And so we've all been historically conditioned to think about cats. But then why am I thinking about that cat now? Why am I having that perception now? Um, something about the unfolding of the world spirit. <laughs> uh, Nietzsche! Okay, that cat is an error in a fantasy, so why are you having the same error in the same fantasy at the same time? I don't know. What would Nietzsche say about that? It's one of his major intellectual failings. He doesn't talk about cats. <laughs> there is no God, so we can't think of that. Ooh, well... <laughs> If there is no God, so we can't think of that. Well, certainly you can't use Barclay's explanation, right? God is dead, so if God used to be doing this, God's not doing it anymore. Um, it's not clear at all what we would say. Now, does this convince everybody on Tlon? Well, by no means. Uh, but it does convince some. And so, Borges continues the story. Unbelievably, these refutations were not definitive. 
A hundred years after the problem was stated, that is to say, this heron, the heresy of the nine points, a thinker no less brilliant than that, that than the heretic, but an orthodox tradition, formulated a very daring hypothesis. This happy conjecture affirmed that there's only one subject. This individual, indivisible subject is every being in the universe. These beings are the organs and masks of the divinity. X is Y and is Z. So that's this explanation. There's really only one. So this is a solipsis view. More or less, there's one mind. There's one consciousness. So we don't have the problem of why your mind and my mind are thinking this thought at the same time. You're just a fiction of my imagination. Eh? There's only my mind. Or actually, there's only your mind. Really, there's just only God's mind. There's only this world mind that is thinking this thought. And we are just facets of this world mind. So it's not a surprise that we agree. The weird thing would be, how do we ever disagree on that? No, well, here's another analogy for thinking about this. Imagine that there are two theaters playing the same movie at the same time. So you walk into this theater, and you're watching, I don't know, the latest Star Wars movie. You go into that theater, it's the same movie at the same time. Now explain that for me in realist terms. They're just, two, they're just two theaters for the leisure people to go to. So. Good. There are two theaters. They happen to be playing the same movie, right? There's the same file or the same strip of film or whatever technology they're using. It's exactly the same thing. Not literally the same film strip or the same computer file, but they're exactly similar. And that's happening in real life. It's, there's a projection mechanism we can talk about. How does the idealist explain that? There's the theater of your mind, the theater of my mind, and they're showing not exactly the same, but really similar movies right now. How does that happen? It's a weird thought, and there's no explanation. Anyway, what does this mean? Well, things don't really have much continuity in Islam, so they become duplicated easily, they become a face, they lose their details when people forget about them. A classic example is the doorway that survived so long was visited by a beggar and disappeared when he died, because nobody else remembered it, knew it was there. At times, the birds, a horse, have saved the ruins of an amphitheater. There were the ruins. They were about to be forgotten. Luckily, a horse had gone by, and so they were still perceived. They continued to exist. But if they were forgotten, they would just no longer exist. Well, here's the part of the story that's really frightening. And keep in mind that Borges is writing this in 1940, just after the outbreak of the First World War, <coughs> And so he's worried about this happening in reality. He says, here's what happens then. The word of this encyclopedia gets out. And Tlon, this fantasy world, starts invading reality. Orbis Tertius, the third world here, publishes a version of the encyclopedia of Tlon. It catches the public imagination. And reality itself begins to yield. People forget about the literature they had been studying up to that point, the philosophy and so on. They start studying the, re the literature, the religion, the philosophy of Tlaan. They forget about actual psychology in this world, actual astronomy and geology. They study all of these things by way of studying Tlaan. And he says, reality yields. The truth is that it longed to yield. People wanted a world that was fully a human construction. They wanted a world that they could understand. And so reality yielded before this vision of a reality that was entirely the construction of human imagination. And so, he writes, 10 years ago, any symmetry with a resemblance of order, dialectical materialism, in Marx, for example, anti-Semitism, Nazism, was sufficient to entrance the minds of men. How could one do other than submit to Tlaw, to the minute and vast evidence of an orderly planet? It is useless to answer that reality is also worthy. Perhaps it is, but in accordance with divine laws. I translate inhuman laws, which we never quite grasp. Tuan is surely a labyrinth, but it's a labyrinth devised by men, a labyrinth destined to be deciphered by men. So here, he is putting his finger on what he perceives to be the chief attraction. And he says it's a real attraction of systems of thought, like Marxism, or Nazism, or various other isms, that give you a way of understanding the world. The world is complicated. It's super hard to understand. If it is really external to us, really out there independent of mind, it's something that may or may not have a structure that is intelligible to us. It's something before which we are answerable. But if the world is our own construction, 
that it's something that is, of course, intelligible. It's something that we created, the structure of. It's, of course, got a structure that we are capable of understanding because we built it. We can decipher it. And so, he says, the contact and the habit of Quan have disintegrated this world. Enchanted by its rigor, humanity forgets over and again that it's a rigor of chess masters, not of angels. Already the schools have been invaded by the conjectural primitive language of Tuan. Already the teaching of its harmonious history, filled with moving episodes, has wiped out the one which governed in my childhood. Already a fictitious past, past occupies our memories, in place of another. Uh, a past which we know nothing with certainty, not even that it's lost. In other words, he's describing a situation in which these stories built by people who were in effect followers of Sorel, who believed in the power of myth, the power of narrative, the power of creating these stories that were intelligible, and organizing and rewriting history, and mythology, and literature, and, and, and religion, and everything else. It's already taking over the world. The world longed to yield to it. And so I think this is Borges seeing the Second World War not simply as a disaster, not simply the result of certain great but evil individuals exercising their will to power, but instead of a reality that longed to yield before systems of thought that promised intelligibility, where earlier they had found complexity and difficulty. This story ends with a reference to Brown's Urn Burry. And so I want to quote you something from that. What is he referring to? He says, I'm working on a translation that I don't intend to publish of this old work. And the most famous part of that work is this. Man is a noble animal splendid in ashes and pompous in the grave, solemnizing nativities and deaths with equal luster, nor om omitting ceremonies of bravery in the infamy of his nature. Life is a pure flame, and we live by an invisible sun within us. That is meant to reflect something of this vision, both of the sun within us, the temptations, but also of reality, the reality of birth, of life, 